principle is that social education can be very effective with children. We've seen this in many different studies. Aronson was asked in the 1960s as schools were desegregating in Austin, Texas, to incorporate um, some sort of program that would help the classrooms to get along better. There was violence in the schools and all kinds of problems. And he developed a system that he called the jigsaw classroom. And in a jigsaw classroom, the children in the class are divided into small groups, say, of five students. And within each group, one child is assigned to learn part of something. Say, if you're learning about Thomas Jefferson, one child would be focusing on his childhood, another one on his years as governor, another one on his years in France, and so on. Then children would get together with the children in all of the other groups who were studying the same section of Jefferson's life as they were. They would develop a way to present this to the whole classroom, and then they would go back to their original group and, and give the presentation. And so you would have then the whole classroom fitting together in a jigsaw, all helping each other. And what Aronson found, and others have, have gone on to do in other jigsaw classroom types of, of arrangements that have been developed, communities of learners and, and other such terms are used to describe them, is that the social relationships of children always improve when you have collaborative learning types of arrangements. And the academic performance of the low performing children always improves. And the academic performance of the high performing children sometimes improves as well. So it's a win-win situation. Nobody loses out when there's a collaborative learning arrangement. And it works in traditional classrooms as well. Peer tutoring is another type of system that we're seeing more and more of in traditional classrooms because it's been shown to work quite well when it's tightly structured. So children will, for example, divide up into pairs, and they're given a, a list of steps to go through where one child tutors the other, say, on spelling words or on math facts, and then they switch places. And when schools have incorporated peer tutoring programs, they find that not only does children's performance improve on the topic at hand for that year, but their performance improves on many different topics across the curriculum and for several years to come, even when the peer tutoring program is no longer being used. So peer tutoring programs are very effective. And finally, another type of social learning that children engage in is learning through imitation. And learning through imitation is something that starts at birth. Uh, Andy Meltzoff from the University of Washington has made his career by going around to hospitals, which we'll call them, say, in the middle of the night, and tell them a newborn baby's been born. Well, he will arrive and stand in front of the baby with a video camera on him and a camera on the baby and look down at them and go, And, and then later, somebody else will code what the baby's face was at each second as you go through the videotape. And they'll know what Andy Meltzoff was doing at the same time. These things will be paired up later. And what they find is that particularly the tongue protrusion, the babies match what Andy Meltzoff was doing with his face significantly more often than you would expect by chance. So babies as young as 42 minutes old are able to engage in imitation of others. And much to parents' dismay, imitative learning goes on um, all, all the way up. Children sometimes imitate things we'd rather that they didn't. And so imitative learning, then, is a third form of social education. However, uh, while imitative learning happens right from birth, the other two forms, people say, not until five or six can children do these things really well. They say, don't try these things with, with children under, under six. However, if you think about the way that we do things in traditional classrooms, we actually are doing them quite opposite to how we know children develop. So for example, when we go into a traditional kindergarten classroom, they'll say, well, now it's your time to learn socially. It's your time to learn how to get along together. So here's the clay table, and here's the painting table, and now it's time to do all of your learning how to get along. Because lo and behold, we get them in elementary school, and whoops, there's your separate desks, and you're not allowed to talk to each other. It's actually against the rules to talk. You're not allowed to take tests together or do homework together. That would be considered cheating. It's all in isolation once you get to elementary school for the most part. Now there is, um, as I said, more use of collaborative learning and peer tutoring programs in schools today than there was when I was young, but it's still taking very little of children's elementary school time. 
So the way that we've set things up then in traditional schools is exactly the opposite of how children develop. Any developmental psychology textbook will tell you that children under five or six are more interested in parallel play. Yes, they engage with each other and interact some, but it's particularly in elementary school that they start to become interested in their peers and want to interact. And by adolescence, they don't even want to come home anymore, right? So. Um, what we've set up then in traditional schools is exactly opposite to how children develop. And so what's children's response to this? Well, they get to elementary school and they find out they're not allowed to talk, so they're desperately you know, passing notes to each other in class and trying to go off to the bathroom together. And their favorite times during the day are often lunch and recess, the times when they get to be social with each other. So. In Montessori classrooms, people are often put off by the fact that you go into a Montessori primary classroom and often the children are working alone, like this boy is working with the geometric solids here. I have one fun story with the, the geometric solids. I was in a school in Oregon and we were watching a child use these over and over again. They, they'll pick them up. They're these beautiful cobalt blue, sort of heavy wooden shapes. And they'll pick them up and put them together and see how they fit together. And they'll spend a long, long time just exploring them. And a teacher one day uh, kept noticing a child who was kind of lying on his back, sort of looking around the room, now and then would turn and do something with the cylinders. And she kept thinking, I've got to go over and redirect him. He's not being constructive. He needs some help getting on a more constructive path this morning. But she kept getting sort of busy with one child after another and wasn't able to get to him. And all of a sudden, this boy came up to her in the middle of, of the morning and looked at her. And he said, Ms. Jones, this room is a rectangular prism. So she was so glad that she hadn't gotten in and um, interfered with this exploration that he was doing. But so the children in primary often choose to work alone. Sometimes they'll go and wash a table together or do some work together. By the end of the primary class, there's even some material that is designed for children to work together, like the bank game that these boys are engaged in. But then by elementary, the children are working together all the time. They're doing the timeline of life together. They're working on reports together. They come up with going out trips together, which are self-designed field trips that a group of two or three or four children together on their own and arrange to go and talk to somebody or arrange to have a parent take them to a museum to study something they've been doing a report on. So by elementary, they're working together all, all the time. And the system is able to work much better with how we know children develop than is the traditional model. In response to the criticism that her schools are not social, Montessori said, but what is social life if not the solving of social problems, behaving properly, and pursuing aims acceptable to all? It is not sitting side by side and hearing someone else talk. So how does, they, how does one accomplish a social education in a Montessori classroom? Well, for one, there are these three-year age groupings. So the classrooms will be children who are, say, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12. Montessori saw the three-year age grouping as very important. And I think it would be interesting to study what happens when there are two-year age groupings. Montessori teachers tell me that it doesn't work nearly as well, that there's something about the three years that seems to really assist the social learning across the ages. But also Montessori saw these particular years as important, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12. And again, it would be an interesting topic for, for further research. So with these three-year age groupings, then the younger children can learn by watching what the older children are doing. They get inspired by the older children. And I've seen the older children tutor the younger children as well uh, quite successfully, where they'll come in and, and work with them, not just on the academic aspects, but also on the social aspects. So I remember, for example, in a uh, school in Nevada where some, some um, nine-year-old girls were working on the floor on a rug, and a six-year-old boy tried to walk kind of right through their work. And they said, no, no, Tommy, you have to go around. So he sort of backed off and started to go around. And he didn't go around enough. And they said, no, no, you have to go all the way around over here. And they showed him. So the children will then help each other with their social learning in a Montessori classroom as well. Montessori is also enhanced by having many different classmates. So when I talked about the demographics, I talked about the ratio of 1 to 25 or 30. 
five, which often puts people off because in traditional classrooms, the lore is that a smaller child-teacher ratio is actually better for learning. Now, in fact, that was true in the Tennessee Star Study, and yet it was not true when they tried to translate that into California in a much different school system. So it actually, there is not really clear research on the demographics of classrooms in terms of, of child learning at this point. Some very successful classrooms in many parts of the world have much larger numbers of children. But in a Montessori classroom also, remember what's so important is the child gains self-control through this concentration on the materials. So the teacher's not trying to manage them. Remember what happened in a traditional classroom when the teacher left. The classroom would go crazy, right? I mean, we all remember, you know, the teacher would walk out of the room and suddenly there'd be lots of noise and everybody going every which way. When a Manasari classroom, when the teacher leaves, nothing happens. In fact, recently I was at a school in Texas, and the head of school told me about a day when a teacher, um, she had she'd gone into a classroom at about 10.30 in the morning, an elementary classroom, and the children were all busily working away, and she needed to find the teacher. And she said, you know, where is the teacher today? And the children looked up at her and said, we haven't seen her. She hasn't come in today. But they were just working away. And Montessori had several similar sorts of anecdotes where primary children would arrive in the morning, the teacher wasn't there, they'd get the janitor to let them in, and they would just proceed to work in the absence of, of the teacher. So a teacher has a different sort of role in a Montessori classroom. They aren't controlling the behavior, they're connecting the children to the environment. And once that's been accomplished, the teacher isn't necessary every moment of the day in the way that they are in a traditional classroom. So when the children have many, many different classmates, what they have is lots of different materials out to inspire them. So they can walk around and say, oh gee, I'd like to try doing that, and I'd like to try doing that. I was in uh, Phyllis Potash Lewis's class in, in California earlier this year, and the children had started making these games to do their grammar work. So a child had developed a board game, for example, for adjectives and all the di learning all the different types of adjectives, which was a fascinating game in and of itself, which would, the child would learn about the adjectives both from making the game and then children would learn about them from playing the game. But also the other children in the classroom had started thinking about making board games for all the different types of lessons that they have. So there was this big game making factory going on. And when you've got a lot of different classmates, you can have different different ideas about things like that coming in, different ideas about what work to do. So that's a, a problem for small Montessori classrooms. You actually want to have um, more children. Children also can learn how to get along with more different types of people when you have a larger class. Um, the one adult then is also something that's important in, in a Montessori classroom because when there are lots of different adults around, the children will go to the adults for help on things rather than go to the other children. So in, in one classroom that I saw recently, a child had been working on a map on her own, and it was a, it was a very difficult map, the map of Europe, and she was just a, a three-year-old, and she really wasn't able to manage this on her own. So she went over and asked some five-year-olds who were working on a long number chain to come and help her, and one of them said, okay, I'll come and help you, and came and sat down and was working on the map with her. And the three-year-old got a little tired of the whole thing and just got up and left and went off to start some other work. And then the other five-year-old that the first girl had been working with before came over to find her to say, you know, why aren't you continuing to work with me on this long number chain that we were working on? And the girl said, well, you know, I was, gonna, I was just coming over to help Marcy with her map, and she's just gone off. And for the next 15 minutes, these two girls sat there working on the map of Europe together, discussing Marcy and how she left them in this difficult situation, because now they had two works out, and you're not allowed to have two works out, and how could they handle this? And they were, all, they were exploring this social issue very much in, in depth. And then Marcy came back along, and they were able to say, you know, Marcy, come on. This was all a situation that the children were handling themselves. The children were figuring out, and they wouldn't have done that if there had been three adult assistants in that classroom to go to. In fact, Marcy wouldn't have gone to ask the five-year-olds for help to begin with. Social education also works in a Montessori classroom because the work is very highly structured. So there's a specific set of steps that the children need to go through, say to build a pink tower or to use the red rods. And peer tutoring works in, in situations in which the work is highly structured. So this orderly system of Montessori then assists the peer tutoring aspect of it. Montessori said, our schools show that children of different ages help one another. Everyone achieves 
a healthy normality through the mutual exchange.